Good morning, and thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be part of this symposium, and I would like first to express my thanks to the Tong Center for Early China at Columbia University, and especially to Dr. Agnes Xu Tang. And my thanks also go to the Asia Society and the partner Asian Civilization Museum in Singapore for bringing the treasures from the Belly Tong shipwreck to the United States on view now at the Asia Society and also for co-sponsoring this symposium. So this morning's panel, the Belly Tong shipwreck in its historical context, situates the shipwreck in a broad historical context and focuses on the issues of maritime trade, the commodities that were traded, the polities that did the trading, and what can be learned from the Belly Tong shipwreck itself. So our lead off speaker is Dr. John Guy. Um, in your very nice program, you have pretty extensive bios, so I'm going to save a little time and not go through the bios. You can read them on your own. Um, but I'll just say a few words. Uh, first, that uh, Dr. Guy is the Florence and Herbert Irving Curator of the Arts of South and Southeast Asia at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and he came from the um, Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, what is not in the bio is something that in a conversation yesterday I had with Dr. Guy, he's something very important, that he doesn't talk about anything um, or a culture or object unless he's actually been there. And if you had seen his exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art um, titled Lost Kingdoms, Hindu Buddhist Sculpture of Early Southeast Asia in 2014, um, you would have been astonished by the works of the Buddhist and Hindu works that came from six countries. Um, let's see, I have them listed here. Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, Myanmar, Malaysia, and Singapore. So indeed, these are only a fraction of the places where he has gone to. So this is an exhortation to all of us to do more travel in our studies. Um, <laughs> the other is about publications. Uh, he was able to forge a lot of relationships, both personally and through his publications. Um, so. Today, um, he's going to be talking about Arab Doe's and the Persian Gulf-China connection in 8th and 9th centuries. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Guy. Thank you, Dora uh, and Agnes. Uh, thank you, everyone. Welcome. Um, so what I thought I would do um, this morning, uh, as I'm the, the first speaker, um, is <clears throat> situate the Bellatung shipwreck in a, in a slightly larger, larger context. Um, all of you have seen the exhibition at Asia Society. It's wonderful material, very evocative, um, and uh, resonates with all sorts of historical messages. So I think it's important that we get um, a, a slightly broader picture of how the Balatong shipwreck um, is, situates itself in the late first millennium uh, Indian Ocean world. Um, the, I'll be specifically addressing the issue of um, Arab dash Persian, uh, Persian Gulf, shall we say, uh, traders and their role in long distance trade uh, that linked uh, the two great ports of the early medieval Asian world, um, Basra, of course, in the Persian Gulf, serving Baghdad, and the ports of southern China, principally um, um, Guangdong, but also a series of other ports uh, going up the coast as far as uh, Yangzhou. So these ports are all critical in, in terms of the uh, international c connectivity that, that China enjoyed um, with the wider uh, West Asian world and, of course, uh, through the Central Asian uh, Silk Route um, into uh, the, the Mediterranean, Mediterranean world. So my, my, my presentation in the, the, the short 30 minutes I have um, is really to, to, give, to introduce the Bellatung um, uh, in, in, in the context of this trade uh, narrative. We had the wonderful presentation last night uh, from uh, uh, Regina Grau, um, uh, looking at the, at, the, at the cargo and its cultural importance and how that resonates uh, with other, other medium. Um, I wanted to concentrate today uh, on, on other aspects. Um, uh, just to give you a, a, a situate you a little, I think the map, map is important. Um, there are little. Uh, this is not a perfectly a perfect map. Uh, some place, key places are missing, um, but it gives you a sense of w w way in which China in the late first millennium was so uh, intimately tied uh, through both land and maritime routes uh, to the wider known world. 
Of course, the key uh, to this in terms of maritime uh, connections is the Indian Ocean. Uh, so Red Sea and Persian Gulf feeding into the Arabian Sea and the greater Indian Ocean linking up to the South China Sea. Uh, the longest historical trade route at the end of the first millennium in the world took you from Basra uh, to South China. Um, and we'd always assumed uh, that this took place through a series of, 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 of a, a chain of trade, as it were, of, of trading systems that interconnected um, and goods passed their way down uh, those trading systems. That, I'm sure, was also was true and, and did exist. But what was came clear to us uh, with the discovery of the Balatung shipwreck off uh, the small island in West Java Sea of the Balatung uh, in 98, an excavation in 98-99, um, uh, the revelation of the cargo as it emerged, and uh, uh, Dr. Crow mentioned last night, the, um, as it slowly dawned on us just how significant and how staggering this, this cargo was in terms of our understanding of, of late material culture of the Tung uh, era. Um, then we got a sense um, that, uh, this, that we were looking at a, a, a another dimension of the trade story that we hadn't fully appreciated, and that was uh, vessels engaged in trade which went from the Persian Gulf all the way to China. Uh, not a chain of trade, but uh, single vessels in some instances, it would seem, doing the entire journey. Um, and what, what pointed to this most compellingly was the ship architecture, that we were looking at a vessel um, of uh, a particular um, construction, uh, which had no use of wooden dials, no use of, of iron nails, uh, but is stitched together um, uh, in, in the Arab dial tradition. A uh, vessel which proved, uh, with later analysis, to have been made in East African hardwoods. The hull of the vessel um, it was uh, constructed of East African uh, mahogany, um, and um, many of the upper deck timbers and so on have proved to be sourced in Southeast Asia. This makes perfect sense. We have a number of late first millennium Chinese commentators who speak specifically about the renovation that was required of vessels whilst journeying uh, in, in the tropical waters. Um, the vessels which went from southern China to Srivijaya would, would, would wait over for the change of directional winds for the monsoons um, to allow them to continue their, their journey and would have maintenance undertaken, restitching, recorking, new deckings and so on fitted in locally sourced materials. But we also have other revelations that come from people like Ibn Battuta in the early 14th century who has a passage where he describes the Arab Dales and their resilience and almost as a footnote mentions and of course the very best cord for binding, for stitching the planks of the Arab Dale is sourced uh, in the Maldives offshore from Sri Lanka, southern Indian Ocean. Great place to holiday, I hear. Those, those particular, they were trading and shipping uh, Maldivian, if that's the word, uh, core, coconut fiber cord uh, around the Arab diaspora to maintain their ships. Uh, and he mentions principally going to Yemen and these Arabian Peninsula sites, but dot, 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 and China. So they were sending the raw, these materials for maintenance of their vessels as far as China to service the, South a the West Asian merchant community in those port cities of, of southern China, south of the Yangtze, essentially. Were they the first? No, they clearly weren't. We have long... Uh, um, archaeological records that take us back now into the early centuries BC, uh, before the common era uh, of uh, Indian trade with Southeast Asia. It's a long uh, history which we can trace increasingly. Um, it's getting earlier and earlier, the more archaeology that's been conducted, particularly in the Thai Peninsula, uh, sites of producing trade material uh, into the uh, second and f first and second centuries BC at least. Um, we have examples of, 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 of South Indian pottery with Tamil Garanta inscriptions um, showing up in the Malay Peninsula. Uh, the same sort of objects have been sourced from late Roman ports in the Red Sea. Um, and so we have this clear linkage where uh, South Indian traders are moving uh, from the southern India uh, into the Red Sea trade and simultaneously linking up to uh, Srivijaya and the Malay Peninsula trade as well. Um, and the, these little a fragment of pottery with a Tamil Granta script inscription tells us that. Uh, on the upper section of the screen, a small stone 
inscribed again in 2nd, 3rd century AD, uh, Tamil, tells us that it's the property of uh, Peramal, the great master goldsmith. It's a touchstone for a goldsmith processing gold in Southeast Asia. We know that the Indians were hungry for gold and they sourced gold extensively in Southeast Asia. We all know the ancient names for Southeast Asia were Savannah Bhumi, Savannah Dweepa. You've probably all flown into the new airport in Bangkok. It's named after the land of gold. That's a Sanskrit name that was given to these islands east of India, renowned for supplying gold. And of course, India, uh, historically, has had an insatiable appetite for gold. It's used in dowry and so on. It remains important today. The gold market is the single most important barometer of prosperity in India, even today. Um, I show you some goldsmiths in Sumatra, photographed in the late 19th century, um, and I would uh, I would put my dollar on the man in the middle of uh, being of Tamil descent. And indeed, we have a series of Tamil inscriptions from Sumatra right through the first millennium, witnessing the presence of uh, Indian traders uh, sourcing uh, forest products, resins, uh, and so on, uh, uh, aromatic woods, and of course, uh, alluvial gold from the rivers. It continues, um, Indian traders, um, renowned. Um, this is a mural, 17th century, in, in, in Tanjo district of South uh, Tamil Nadu, South India, gem traders. They're exchanging precious stones in a transaction uh, seated on this little podium. And the inscription I show you is from Barus in West Sumatra, uh, 11th century, names a Indian merchant guild and sets out requirements for membership of the guild, um, paying your dues in gold. And if you pay your dues in membership, if you're a paid up member, you're allowed to, to sit on the spread cloth, this is the terminology they use, which means you're permitted to engage in trade. And that, of course, is what we see in this mural painting. So you can see how the Indian presence was there very early uh, and very long term. And uh, Indian merchants in South China major players uh, in, in, in Guangdong, um, in Quanzhou a little later in the Song and Yuan periods, um, and, and the other early South China ports. China itself um, had close engagement with, um, with Southeast Asia from uh, not quite as early, I, I would suggest, as India, but still um, into the early centuries uh, AD. Um, and um, I, I should perhaps just clarify when I speak about southern China here, I'm really essentially talking about uh, the region south of the Yangtze River. Uh, this is the, the region which in the early centuries AD was not Han, it wasn't Han, well, it was UA people and other ethnicities, a uh, region that extended um, really from Czechian, Fujian, Guangdong, uh, west into Yunnan. Uh, all of these regions were really outside China proper uh, in much of the, uh, particularly the first half of the first millennium, um, and extending, of course, into Tonkin and to what today is northern Vietnam. That represents a cultural unity quite distinct and separate from Han culture. Um, and that is where the trade was happening. Um, they were outside central authority to a large degree. Guangdong is still infamous for being relatively lawless. Um, officials still get arrested for corruption in Guangdong at a higher rate than probably anywhere else in China. Um, this this is, fits a historical pattern that's been going on for um, probably one and a half millennium. So, um, but we do have uh, early witnesses to the context between China and Southeast Asia uh, as early as the as this, the sixth century. This. A scroll which many of you will recognize showing the 12 um, ambassadors who were attending the Liang court in, I think this is 539 AD. Um, of the 12 ambassadors, 11 are from West Asia, Central Asia, West Asia. Only one is shown in bare chested, wearing a lungi, a waist cloth, and so on, and disorderly hair. He's a Southeast Asian. Um, and the, the inscription identifies it as coming from the kingdom of Lankasuka, um, and we, there's much discussion about precise location, but if you put it somewhere down towards Songkhla Patani on the southern Thai Peninsula, you're not, Nakhon Sitamarat, you're not far away from the correct location of where Lankasuka probably was uh, in the 5th and 6th centuries. Uh, we know it had very important contacts and was eventually uh, in long distance trade and was eventually absorbed into the Funan kingdom of, of, of the Mekong Delta. So here we have our first depiction 
uh, in the historical record of a Southeast Asian uh, early 6th century. Uh, this is roughly where Alenkasuka would be. Funan is centered on the Delta region of uh, southern Vietnam, of the Mekong Delta, which of course was Khmer speaking historically, and not, not uh, the Vietnamese, a very, very late edition. Um, the Chinese uh, presence in, in, in southern, so, uh, sorry, the Muslim in presence in, in, in southern China is well documented, um, and we have one of the earliest surviving mosques, it's, of course, is in, in, in Guangdong, and many of you have visited uh, this, um, and um, we have uh, uh, very useful Chinese sources which give us a very clear sense of the scale of the foreign, the expatriate communities operating in South in South China in the late first millennium. And in the course of the 8th and the 9th and early 10th century, uh, there are a series of historical uh, of, um, uh, uh, events, uh, social upheaval, um, which involved um, uh, rebellion on one, in one case, the rebe rebellion of the foreign merchant community uh, oppressed by excessive taxation in Guangdong, uh, rioting, burning the city. It's documented uh, some years later we have uh, civil disorder, foreign communities being uh, purged uh, in, 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 um, in Yangzhou. Um, all of these are recorded in the dynastic histories and give us a real sense of both the cosmopolitan nature of, of early uh, uh, these early port cities of China and, and, the, sh and the scale, that these were really big foreign communities uh, resident and even larger ones seasonally as the ships, the fleets arrived and the numbers came and, and so on. Um, this is the sort of material, uh, this is uh, Islamic glass and ceramic material that's been excavated in Malaysia, in Kedar, uh, near Penang Island on the main, on the peninsula. Uh, Kedar is almost certainly the Arabic site of Kala, uh, appears in all the early geographies of the, starting in the 8th and 9th centuries, um, and witnesses the contact. And when the foreign communities were obliged to flee uh, Guangdong and uh, retreat south, they moved to Tonkin and they moved uh, to, to Kala and operated from there, uh, outside the reach of China. Um, and again, the archaeology bears witness to this. Uh, the, this uh, blue glazed material, top center, I'll show you some recently excavated pieces of la these large storage jars uh, that have been found in, in, in the last uh, year or so, um, which are, 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 uh, bear witness, uh, which in, in, an, in an early ninth century context. Uh, the mosque, uh, uh, in, in Chuanzhou and Fujian, uh, one of many mosques that existed, and of course there were, we know there, there were at least two Hindu temples active in, in, this, in Chuanzhou as well. In the Song and Yuan periods we have inscriptions, we have sculptural remains from these Hindu temples which no longer exist, they were torn down and disappeared from the landscape. The mosques continued because there of course was a Chinese Muslim community to sustain them. Um, Ship architecture is very important in all of this. Um, many of you will know about the, the uh, very important Sung era shipwreck, which was found uh, in the harbor of um, the, the Chuanzhou in, in, in Fujian, um, loaded with aromatic woods, as best one can tell from the traces that have been recovered from the, uh, the, 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 uh, the embedded in the bulkheads and so on uh, and various spices. So clearly coming back from Southeast Asia with aromatics and spices as its principal cargo. Um, but the ships which were most important in the regional trade in this early period were indigenous Malay style ships. Um, and I show you the excavations that were happening, uh, happened over the last 15, 20 years in uh, Mindanao in southern um, Philippines, in Butuan, uh, where we have this particular type of indigenous Malay vessel, uh, lashed lug construction, totally different to Chinese uh, ships with their bulkheads, rigid frame, and totally different uh, from the Arab ships. And as the Arab ships want to talk about today, um, essentially we have uh, several extraordinary extraordinarily descriptive uh, depictions of Arab Dals from the uh, uh, 13th century, early 13th century. Uh, this is one in the Bibliothèque Nationale. Uh, this one is in the Academy of Sciences in St. Petersburg. Um, and you can see very clearly the stitched construction um, detailed uh, in the vessels. Um, and 
and so on, the particular uh, uh, manner of uh, anchor that's employed and so on, the uh, lateral rudder and so on. Um, and we have a model here constructed of the Balatung uh, ship uh, on the left, which is now in Singapore, I believe. Um, other Arab dials again appear, uh, the mural painting showing our gem traders, that same temple has uh, this depiction of Arab traders uh, active in um, uh, southern India. We know that the Arab traders were the principal uh, uh, agents for supplying horses, uh, cavalry horses to the Vijayanaga kingdom in south India, um, very, very important in the 15th and 16th centuries um, and beyond, and, and here they are engaged in the, their horse trade. Islamic trade is witnessed by a whole range of things. There have been stray uh, coinage found in Chinese tombs, uh, as many of you all know, of course, Sasanian coins found in um, uh, pre-Islamic Sasanian coins found in Xi'an, um, and then Abbasid Islamic coins appearing um, in the uh, 8th, 9th century. Um, and the, the gold dinars become very, very important uh, and real sort of markers as indeed the ceramics are markers of the uh, historical landscape. We can read the history through the ceramics in the way that we can't through textiles, which were almost certainly equally important or perhaps more important commercially, they're gone. They don't survive in any quantities that allow analysis in the maritime context. Um, So-called Arab jars, we have a inscription in central Vietnam, a charm inscription dated from the, nine, I think, 961, where the King Indravarman of, uh, of Champa sent 20 Arab jars as tribute to China, to the then, the then court. And around the same time, within a generation, uh, we have a, a very important um, tomb of the queen of the ruler of the kingdom of Min in Fujian, in which three of these jars, this is one of them, were recovered. They were clearly seen as prestige items um, and um, placed in a, a, you know, a, okay, a small, small marginal kingdom, but nonetheless uh, fairly autonomous. Uh, the Southern Han and the Min were really the, uh, they were outsiders to uh, mainstream authority in China, being based in uh, so far south. Uh, but of course, they were immensely wealthy because they controlled the international sea trade and so had to do business. And of course, they made their, their money supplying elite objects uh, to you know, central China, to the Chinese elite. Uh, these jars keep showing up. Uh, these are examples from the Middle East, and the one on the left uh, uh, was, was uh, sourced uh, and remains in the Philippines. We have fragments of these uh, right along the Indian Ocean's uh, maritime routes. Um, it, the est where the Indus River meets the Arabian Sea, a uh, very important trade uh, uh, entrepot. Uh, and here we have uh, one, of the, uh, one of the spectacular jars that were recovered in the 1950s, together with an assortment of what you now recognize, of course, as uh, Changsha and Ding and other sort of white wares and so on, and uh, the, the, the Guangdong storage jars. Here's the new find in uh, Indonesia of these sort of jars in a secure uh, early 9th century context, a series of these one metre high jars. These are the, one imagines, these are the jars that, you know, Sinbad the sailor he hid in, the big oil jars and so on. This, this is the time frame precisely we're in, and these are the jars that are ex existed at that time made in the Persian Gulf. Make your, draw your own conclusions. Um, Thai Peninsula, beach at low tide, um, uh, scattered with uh, ceramics, precisely the type of material we have in the exhibition um, that you've all seen at Asia Society. Green splashed wares, white wares with recessed foot, so called Samara white wares, um, and um, green, green UA wares, the storage jars, and so on. It, precisely the profile. Um, of the Bellatung cargo. This is material I photographed in the little uh, site museum um, at Liempo in, in the 1980s. And there it is. There's your Changsha material and so on. Exactly what we're seeing in the exhibition. 
I want to quickly now take you through the three shipwrecks. I don't want to, I won't linger on the Bellatung because others will be speaking in more detail, um, but just to show you the reconstruction of the Bellatung, um, which was a gift of the government of Muscat, of Oman, uh, to Singapore and sailed the journey. Wonderful uh, piece of re historical reconstruction. There it is in Singapore in the warehouse. Um, the loading of the cargo. We know that um, uh, many of the ceramics were stacked into jars made in the um, Pearl River uh, Delta region of, of, of Guangdong. Um, but the, the ceramics are down here, but the ceramics have sourced to many other places, um, uh, Changsha, uh, Huey, uh, Guangxian, uh, and so on, Ding. Uh, all of these centers, well-connected sites with riverine connections to the coast. Uh, the canal or river tributaries would connect and feed the cargoes, um, and no doubt they were brought down the coast, consolidated, um, and merchants selected what they wanted, as one does in a, you know, a wholesale situation. And this is how they, many of them traveled, um, stacked in jars. When I was first shown a couple of, 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 of Changsha bowls uh, sitting in my office in the VNA, they were FedExed over, I think, if the FedEx existed then, um, in 98. Um, and the person walked in and said, what are these? And I said, well, they look like fake Changsha to me. I mean, I've seen hundreds of Changsha fragments and shards. I've never seen pieces in this as new condition. Um, of course, they weren't fake. They were uh, just in perfect condition because they'd been protected in these storage jars. But most, of course, travelled like this, tied into bundles with rattan and stacked uh, in, 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 in forming, representing ballast, of course, in the, in the lower sections of the, of the vessel. Uh, I won't dwell on this. Uh, Regina Kral spoke last night about this ex extraordinary object, which is clearly of imperial quality. We know the Xi'an uh, finds the two great hordes in Xi'an that um, uh, have analogous material. Um, here is the, uh, pilgrim, the uh, pilgrim Fask, um, uh, which is too brittle and fragile. Archaeological silver is a problem uh, that wasn't able to travel. Jars uh, clearly made for the Islamic market, um, with inscriptions, some in Chinese, but some in pseudo-Arabic. And we have a number of these coming from Java. And then the one on the lower right is David Whitehouse's excavation at Suraf, uh, the great early port serving Iran. This is Bellatung, and these are the new jars just found in central Java. The inscribed dated uh, bowl, which we saw last night, um, this extraordinary ball, which has a depiction, the only one, of the 60,000 Changsha wares, uh, which has a depiction of a ship. People like to think it's a Tao. I don't think it is, but it's fascinating nonetheless. Uh, Changsha moulded ewers. Um, these wares appear so widely. These are excavated material um, from the uh, excavations done around the, the footings of... of um, uh, Obeyagiri stupa at Anuradhapura in Sri Lanka. Uh, and we know that Mantai uh, was a key uh, port in northern Sri Lanka supplying the central plateau with this sort of material. We have the examples. Um, just to show which way in which ceramics can really create a whole historical picture where we don't have documents. Here we have a complete bowl from the Belatong. Uh, here is a fragment of the same type of where we used to think was rather later, with this moulded medallion in the centre of a dragon, excavated in Nishapur in Iran. And we have a third example, which was uh, excavated at Yangzhou in the port area, where they were, we know they were loading for shipment abroad. So we have the kiln material, we have Yangzhou, we have the Bellatung, and we have Iran, all with identical moulded medallion, green splashed, Guangxian ware. There's your, there's your historical picture that ties it all together, if you like, into a, a much wider uh, story. Local kiln, kiln waste on the left, uh, Guangxian ware on the right. I'm going to skip through some of these because uh, time is tight. Um, green splash Chinese wares excavated at Samara, which had a short life in the ninth century as an alternative capital city to Baghdad, between Baghdad and Basra. Um, and much of this material excavated by the Germans in 1913. Uh, quick footnote, uh, confiscated, some of it's in Berlin. The first shipment got to Berlin. 
The rest was confiscated by T. E. Lawrence and, 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 and his camel cavalry and shipped to London and is now in the British Museum in V&A. Here's a little historical anecdote. You find, um, this is an extraordinary uh, spouted ewer, green splashed. It was recovered in the excavations at Bagan, capital of Burma, 10th, 12th century capital of Burma. But this is clearly pre, dates earlier, but probably came from the a capital, a small capital which predated Bagan uh, in the same district, um, which is located sort of 10 or 15 kilometers south. Um, and, uh, but as a luxury good was moved to the new capital in the 10th century. This is our first example uh, of green splashed wares coming from Mia, historical context in Myanmar. So all the major elites were linking up to this trade. The spectacular Yua you know about, Here's your metal prototype. This is in the Sosho Inn in Nara. Um, and I'll, I would wager it's Chinese made based on um, Sasanian prototypes. Here you have this um, very distinctive uh, motif, uh, the quatrefoil with the little floral uh, flourishes at the ends, um, a very important, I think, a signature motif in the, in the cargo. Here's uh, one of the Samara pieces now in Berlin and uh, Iraqi uh, works inspired by that design. Here it is um, in uh, the blue and white, uh, blue in white uh, uh, wear in the cargo. Uh, this is from uh, almost certainly uh, from Guangxian and excavated in the harbor area of Yangzhou. Quickly, uh, the Chao Tan wreck, mid 9th century, it's a problem. Um, it's uh, Quang Nai province south of uh, Nha Trang. Um, it's heavily contaminated. Uh, the site has many wrecks on it. So there's uh, what's well, clearly tongue material and then Song and later material, impossible to um, unravel. There's no archeology, span it's been looted, but um, uh, it would have served one of the river estuaries like this. This is not Trung, um, early 20th century, um, but we're getting early Changsha material uh, coming from this site. Unre I mean, undocumented, it's just sitting um, in a private collection in the local town, but accessible to researchers. Uh, uh, coins and, uh, and so on. Uh, but it does have two things of particular interest. Bits of timbers that were recovered clearly for stitching. We're looking at Tao construction here and these inscriptions on, on uh, earthenware Chinese pottery which um, uh, proved a great problem uh, but uh, appeared uh, the closest anyone's got to identifying this is um, early Malay. And, of course, the Chum language is, uh, of course, a close relative of Malay language. Um, and there's a whole history there. So uh, that's uh, important. And finally, the Panom Surin wreck, which is this new wreck in the Gulf of Thailand, um, enormously important. And I'm going to skip uh, straight to the heart of this. It's located between uh, two river estuaries, the uh, uh, Praya, which runs past Bangkok, of course, um, and, and the a, a river immediately to, to, to the west. It's in that sort of delta area between, between the two and uh, perfectly situated for serving all the great uh, urban centers of 8th century Mon Thailand, of Nakhon Patom, of Kubawa, and so on. Uh, there's the wreck as uh, excavated in 2014. Uh, a developer was opening up a prawn farm, leveling the land, and uh, discovered this reported it to the authorities. It's been a controlled excavation for two seasons. Uh, tim stitched timbers on the left. This is the Bellatong reconstruction on the right using traditional methods in Muscat. Uh, the mast, uh, the Kielsen pulleys, original ropes and fibers all surviving. It's a saturated landscape, um, mangrove essentially today. Uh, Ivory, a whole, a tusk and, and antler, we know were used in trade. And then the extraordinary find of these, uh, the Chinese wares are not so exceptional, um, but we find for the first time ever in Southeast Asia, uh, Persian Gulf uh, amphora, what we call 
torpedo jars in the trade. Uh, these pointy bottom jars, uh, which we know were stacked um, and related, of course, to the, uh, you know, the early um, uh, Roman amphora, a descendant of that. Um, this is the first time ever these have been discovered. Uh, they're plentiful on the Gulf. They're plentiful down the east coast of Africa. Uh, local earthenware pottery. I'll skip my time is up. A Chinese inscription uh, just mentions an office. Um, Islamic wares um, of this type. Uh, it's the uh, torpedo jar lined um, with, with uh, a black substance to make them um, not, uh, because they're, really, they're porous earthenware, so they have a lining, and that's proved to be uh, uh, bitumen. Um, and um, analysis has been done of other examples of that. Uh, this is a Persian Gulf example that was uh, excavated fairly recently, and I show you the 6th century uh, junta mural of, of uh, how these jars may well have travelled. You see them stacked on the foredeck here. Inscription. One of them is inscribed in, uh, remarkably, is inscribed in uh, what's proved to be Pahlavi, which is the language of the Sasanians. Um, and we know that Pahlavi had an afterlife beyond the Sasanians into the uh, 8th and 9th centuries um, and used by non, particularly by non-Muslim Iranian traders. And the Chinese distinguish very clearly between Persian Muslims and Persian non-Muslims. They, they, they're different terms. So uh, here we have uh, this Pahlavi inscription and it's been translated um, uh, by the professor of uh, Middle Iranian languages at Harvard. Um, it's a proper name. It's a person's name. So it's his, his property or someone engaged in the trade. And then I was delighted very recently to find uh, this garnet ringstone, um, also engraved in uh, Pahlavi, uh, which was excavated, discovered, came through the art trade. One can't be 100% sure, but I've checked my sources um, and said, oh, yes, no question. My dealer gets all his stuff from South Sumatra. Palembang, we're back in Srivijaya again in the 8th or 7th, 8th, 9th century. So I think I will stop there. Um, two new Pahlavi inscriptions demonstrating the importance of Iranian uh, traders uh, in the Persian Gulf uh, trade with, with, with China. Um, and this is where the Bellatung sits very comfortably into this bigger picture of these other shipwrecks. Thank you.